Today's scripture reading is from Matthew 24, 36 to 44. The day and hour unknown. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what the day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have left his house, would not have left his house to be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is a Pulitzer Prize winning book written by a Jewish man named Eliezer Weissel, and the title of the book is Night. It is a memoir documenting his experience as a 15 year old occupant of the Nazi concentration camps. Elie Weissel grew up in a small Romanian village, the village of Seget. When the Germans invaded his country, all the Jews were immediately deported. They were herded onto cattle cars, and a nightmarish journey began. After days and nights crammed into the car, exhausted and near starvation, the passengers arrive at Birkenau, the gateway to Auschwitz. Upon his arrival to Birkenau, Eli and his father are separated from his mother and sisters, whom they never see again. The Jewish arrivals are stripped, shaved, disinfected, and treated with almost unimaginable cruelty. They eventually arrive in Buna, a work camp, where Eliezer is put to work in an electrical fittings factory. Under slave labor conditions, severely malnourished, a vicious foreman forces Eliezer to give him his gold tooth, which is pried out of his mouth with a rusty spoon. Because of the horrific conditions in the camp and the ever-present threat of death, many of the prisoners themselves begin to slide into cruelty, concerned only with personal survival. Sons began to abandon their fathers. Eliezer himself begins to lose his humanity and faith, both in God and in other people around him. As the war rages on, the Nazis decide to evacuate the camp because the Russians are invading and on the verge of liberating the prisoners. And so in the middle of a snowstorm, the prisoners begin a death march. They're forced to run for more than 50 miles to the Gleitzwitz concentration camp, and many die of exposure to the harsh weather or to exhaustion. At Gleiswitz, the prisoners are herded into cattle cars once again and begin another dead journey. 100 Jews board the car, but only 12 remain alive when the train reaches the concentration camp Buchenwald. Throughout the ordeal, Eliezer and his father help each other survive by looking out for one another. In Buchenwald, however, Eliezer's father dies of dysentery and physical abuse. Eliezer survives an empty shell of a man, and on April 11, 1945, the day that the American army liberates the camp, 
he survives. Now at this point, if I were you, I might be wondering why the pastor would begin the Advent season with a horrific story such as this. Well, Elie Weissel's horrific tale reminds us of the great hatred, cruelty, and violence which mankind is capable of. But more than that, it speaks to the great power of something we call hope. Each day, Elie Weissel had to make a choice. He had to choose whether he would consider his fate as hopeless and give in to despair, or was he going to fight on to live another day in the hope that one day he would be free again? He compared the darkness and evil of his experience to night, thus the title of his memoir. But what kept him going was the belief that what always follows the night is the dawning of the day, the rising of the sun, the arrival of light. That is the expectation that helped him to survive, keeping hope alive. When we consider the context of the Advent story in Scripture, you may recall that the Jews hadn't heard a peep from God in more than 400 years. Since the prophet Malachi had penned the final words of the Old Testament, God had been silent. As their homeland was invaded by the Greeks and by Rome, these foreign occupants ruled over Israel ruthlessly. And it seemed as if God had abandoned them. They might have asked, where is this promised Messiah? When will our deliverance come? It is a spiritual time of darkness, dark as night. And there doesn't seem to be much hope, not a glimmer of dawn's early light anywhere, not for 400 years, not until out of the darkness there appeared a star. And you know the song, a star, a star dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite. You've heard that song. That's a song about hope. That's hope piercing through the darkness. It's a marker in the sky that led a few foreign kings, the Magi, to the birthplace of the Savior. They knew that hope was on the way. Now, what does all of this have to do with the scripture passage that was read? Well, the passage was from Matthew chapter 24, and it's the words of Jesus decades after his arrival on earth as a baby in Bethlehem. And it's actually quite a gloomy passage. It's words of darkness and gloom. Matthew 24 begins this way. Jesus left the temple. He was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The disciples were curious, just as we are today, about the end times. When will it happen? And how do we know when Jesus will come back? It's kind of like the 400 years between the Testaments. We've been waiting 2,000 years for Jesus to come again. That's a long time to wait. There's been many periods of time during that span that have seemed rather dark and hopeless. In fact, there's half a millennia, roughly from 500 to 1,000 A.D., that's known as the Dark Ages. Where is God? He said he was coming soon. So why should I believe his promises? You know, as every new year dawns, I find myself wondering, is this going to be the year? Is this the year that will initiate the end times events leading to the Lord's second coming? I believe the first of those events will be the rapture of the church which will immediately be followed by the great tribulation period of seven years, a period that will mercifully end in the return of Jesus to earth to reign and rule over the world. 
The writings of the early church fathers reveal that one of the earliest prayers of the church was just a one-word prayer, Maranatha, 1 Corinthians 16, 22. The word is actually an Aramaic phrase that means, Come, Lord Jesus. That prayer expresses a fact that is confirmed by many other scriptures, the fact that the early church had a passionate desire for Jesus to return soon. However, the 21st century church seems to have lost that desire. Most professing Christians today do not pray Maranatha. We do not yearn for the return of the Lord. In fact, I can remember as a teenager thinking, Lord, can you just wait to come back a little bit longer? You know, I'm still a virgin. I've got business to take care of before you return. Sorry if that's too much information, just being real. But the point is, we may find the topic of the end times something interesting to talk about. It's an interesting theological study and conversation, but we don't often yearn for it. Which is sad because Titus 2 verse 13 says that the return of the Lord is our blessed hope. There's that word again, hope. We are constantly admonished in Scripture to watch for the Lord's coming and to be ready. That's what was in that passage in Matthew 24. Jesus says, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. So be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Jesus came to earth once before in Bethlehem, and he's promised to come again. And there's at least four reasons why every Christian should earnestly desire the second coming of Jesus. You want to know what they are? I hope you do, because I'm going to tell you. And you can write these down. On the back of your bulletin, there is an outline. If you want to write them down, you're free to do that. The first reason is this. Jesus, when he returns, will finally receive what he deserves, which is honor, glory, and power. When he came the first time, he was born in a stable, raised in poverty. He was nailed to a tree and buried in a borrowed tomb. He was despised by the Jews, rejected in his hometown, snubbed by his own family. He was persecuted by the religious leaders, betrayed by a friend, denied three times by another friend, deserted by the disciples, and mocked by the masses. He had no place to lay his head, and his only possessions were the clothing that he wore. Today, many people scoff at Jesus and ridicule him. They doubt his words. They disbelieve his claims. They use his name as a cuss word. This is not what Jesus deserves. But it's going to be different at the second coming. The first time he came as a gentle, helpless baby... He's going to return as a mighty warrior to do battle with the forces of evil. He came the first time as a suffering lamb to die for the sins of the world. But he'll return as a majestic lion who will pour out the wrath of God on those who have rejected the love, mercy, and grace of God. He came the first time as a servant And he's returning as a judge and king. At his second coming, Jesus will be vindicated and glorified. All the nations of the earth will bow down. As the Apostle Paul says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what Jesus deserves. He deserves honor and glory and power. Amen? That's what he deserves, and at his second coming, that's what he will get. But there's a second reason we should long for Christ's return, and it involves the enemy of God, Satan. When Jesus returns, Satan will finally get what he deserves, which is dishonor, disgrace, and defeat. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of Satan. I'm tired of his plots and schemes and lies and deceptions. 
I'm fed up with all the diseases that he dreams up. COVID-19, just being one of them. I'm fed up with the temptations that he taunts us with. I'm weary of his physical, emotional, and spiritual oppression. I'm disgusted with his wrecking of marriages and families. I loathe his hatred, violence, and wars and acts of terrorism. I can't stand the sinful cravings and addictions that he inflicts upon our youth. I despise his ceaseless attacks on the church. The fate of Satan was sealed at the cross, but his treacherous activities will continue until the Lord returns. At that time, the Bible says that God will deal with Satan decisively. Romans 16, 20 says that Satan will be crushed under his feet. The book of Revelation says that he will then be thrown in the lake of fire and will be tormented there day and night forever and ever. But Satan doesn't want to go to hell alone. He's working overtime to take as many people with him as he can. And I want that work stopped. I don't want Satan to do any more damage. I want him to get what he deserves, which is dishonor, disgrace, and defeat. Amen? There's another reason we should long for Christ's appearing, and it involves the world around us, creation. When Jesus returns, the earth will finally receive what it has been promised which is restoration. Those of you who are environmental, who care about conservation and protecting the planet, you should be overjoyed by this. The material universe was originally created in beauty and perfection. There were no poisonous plants or animals. There weren't any meat-eating animals because there was no death, no disease, no natural disasters like earthquakes or floods or tornadoes. Mankind lived in perfect harmony with nature. But when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, one of the consequences of their sin was that God placed a curse on the creation. Poisonous plants and animals suddenly appeared. Weeds began to grow in the garden. The animal kingdom turned against itself and the natural catastrophes began to take their toll and mankind had to struggle against nature in order to survive. But the moment that God placed that curse on creation, he promised that one day it would be lifted. And Paul reaffirms that promise in the New Testament in the 8th chapter of Romans. He pictures the whole creation as being like a pregnant woman gripped by birth pains, crying out for that moment of delivery. Look at this passage. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. What all of this means is that on the day the Lord returns, the earth will be renovated, refreshed, and beautified. The destructive forces of nature will be curtailed. Deserts will bloom. The plant and animal kingdoms will be redeemed. Poisonous plants and animals will cease to be a danger. The lion will lie down with the lamb, which means carnivorous animals will become herbivorous. All of nature will seek to be in conflict against itself. Instead, it will work harmoniously to benefit all of creation. Doesn't that sound like a beautiful world? It also means an end to all of the problems of pain and sadness and suffering and heartache and hunger, disease and death 
and dying. That's a world worth yearning for. Amen? Our final reason that we should long for Christ's return is it involves the nations. When Jesus returns, the nations will finally receive what they have been promised, which is peace, righteousness, and justice. Isn't that what's missing from our society today? Humanity has dreamed of world peace throughout history. Disarmament treaties have been negotiated. Peace treaties have been signed. International organizations have been created. But true peace has never really happened. Here in the U.S., we hear constantly about the need for social justice. We long for there to be reconciliation between races and tribes. The Bible says that permanent peace will never be achieved until the Prince of Peace, the Messiah, returns. Both Isaiah and Micah prophesied this, that when the Lord returns, the nations shall hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. That's pretty amazing to think about. The hope of the world for peace will never be realized in summit conferences between heads of state. The only hope is the return of Jesus who will rule the world in perfect power and peace. Do you see why the Bible refers to Jesus' second coming as a blessed hope? A few years ago, I recall sitting in a Christmas church service such as this, and the following lyrics appeared on the big screen, and everybody sang, The thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. And the lyric comes from the well-known Christmas carol, O Holy Night, and the line in that song stood out to me on that day, in that church service, and it caught my attention because I never really realized how thrilling the concept of hope can be. Hope is actually something we all need, probably more than we realize. Because without hope, life is desperate and depressing, and we feel alone. Like the song says, we feel weary. I don't know what makes you weary, life itself can be weary. We get busy, we lose sleep, we struggle to pay bills, our families suffer, troubled relationships arise, we bend over backwards to try to please others. Life has a way of being wearisome, doesn't it? It has a way of handing us headaches, hassles, and hardships. But hope, that's what we need in order to endure the trials that inevitably happen in life. In fact, we all need hope in order to carry on. Because without it, our failures will paralyze us, our defeats will be crushing, and our disappointments will demoralize. So what disappointments do you face in life today? I would encourage you to stoke the fire of hope in your life. Because there is a light at the end of every dark tunnel. And the darkness of your disappointment is usually only a temporary circumstance. When you're weary and in need of strength, seek out the source of hope. His name is Jesus. And you'll find him if you're willing to follow the light. To seek him out. And I hope to see you make it to the end of whatever dark tunnel you might find yourself in right now. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. You get it? Yeah. Father, as we begin this Advent season, it is a time to celebrate the arrival of your son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, born of a virgin, 
and begotten by your spirit as a baby in Bethlehem. This is a mystery too miraculous to explain, but I pray, Lord, that this season we will not forget about your promises of a second coming. A second coming just as miraculous and unexpected, only bigger and better than your last appearance. May Jesus receive the honor, glory, and power he deserves. May evil be defeated, the creation restored, and the nations be at peace at last. We long for this in the precious name, the holy name of Jesus. Amen.